Hello folks, this is Tom from anti-proton.com and this right here is Trinitite. What is Trinitite? Well, it's glass melted in the fires of the very first nuclear explosion ever, well, man-made on Earth. Uh, I believe it was July 16, 1945. It was a 20 uh, kiloton, sorry, yeah, about a 20 kiloton weapon. So that's 20,000 tons of TNT exploding at once, like a stick of dynamite, 20,000 tons of that. That's the equivalent energy that came out of it. It's like 80-something terajoules, I believe, off the top of my head. <clears throat> anyway, all that energy melted the ground around the original test site, which was sand, turning it into glass. Here it is. So Trinitite, um, which I got some samples from a friend of mine, uh, hello Martin. So basically put, these samples come from Martin, and they, 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 they were really just at one point sand outside of the Trinity test ground. The, the, the uh, device was detonated to test whether or not a nuclear weapon would work. It was a plutonium weapon. And the result was this melted glass. Um, there had been questions as to whether or not these little guys right here were actually parts of the tower. One of them, I believe this guy right here, I, I think may actually be a little bit of metal which means it's possible it could actually be melted tower, because the tower that the nuke was on turned pretty much to vapor and liquid and flew out every direction, and as it cooled, it could have made little BB shapes, and that was, could be what this guy is right here. I looked at them under the microscope, which I'll show you in just a moment, to see if that was the case. But anyway, so I'll also show you some close-ups of what they look like, because from this distance, it's hard to see. However, what I will do from this distance is I will show you uh, what they, how they react under the Geiger counter. So, let's take off our glove. There we go. Here is a Geiger counter. Let's take it out of its little housing. This is an Inspector USB Plus. Cut it on so we can hear the sound. It's about 20, 28, 30, something like that counts per minute. It's not getting very much radiation as you can see. It's not picking up very much. Don't want to touch the samples. Over top of the samples, not getting very much. 86, 102 counts per minute, 138, 164, 164. So the samples aren't very radioactive. They're not particularly dangerous outside of the body. One does not want them to get into the body, however. 362, 400 counts per minute. I think I've gotten 500 off of them before. 520, uh, 424, 450. So let's cut this off now and let's in, use a scintillation counter like this guy right here to test. This is a scintillation counter. It measures gamma radiation in counts per minute on the screen. So let's test and see what kind of radiation we get off of them with this. All right, so we have these grouped as follows. The major size trinitite samples right here. The little guy that we think could be part of the tower right here. These guys right here that are obviously just little itty bitty microscopic versions of these. By the way, the reason these are circular is they were probably blown into the air as they were melted and that's how they formed and cooled into little balls. These guys right here were on the ground and baked down. They were two big, probably large slabs of dirt that were just fused into, into to glass and then cracked. So we have this guy right here, the scintillation counter, set on the times 10 scale. So everything you see reading on the screen here is times 10. Zero, 1,000 counts, two, three, four, 5,000 counts per minute, okay? So let's cut the sound on. And as you can see, our background is around just about 1,000 counts per minute. It's one of the lowest places in, in the entire house. So let's take this and see what we get. Let's first go with the tower. Virtually nothing. Now let's go for the little ones. Maybe I saw a little bit, but not much. Now let's go for the big ones. Maybe a little. There we go. But still not very much. So, they're not terribly radioactive. When we put the Geiger counter over them, they are a little bit stronger. Let's test them individually. So let's start out with the big ones. 
All right, so the big one gives me about 630 counts per minute, plus or minus. Not bad. What about the tower? The tower gives a little bit over maybe three, four times background radiation. It varies. We could be picking up a little bit of this, but probably not much. It is pound for pound reasonably radioactive compared to the other two, other two samples. Now for the small ones. All right, so we're getting about 200 counts per minute off of the small ones. Not bad. Oops, I moved them. They fell. They rolled a little bit. All right, so as you can see, they're not terribly radioactive. Now we're going to look at them under the microscope, up close, and we're going to do some gamma spectroscopy to see what's inside these things. Why are they radioactive? Let's go do that. All right. This is what it looks like at 400 times magnification. Look at the crystals. Tiny little crystals formed everywhere from the rapid heating and then rapid cooling. These crystals take millions of years, well, equivalent crystals, to form by themselves. Stuff also got stuck within the crystals, too. Look at that. Looks like a little crater. There it is, right there. That's actually probably, it's hard to say if something impacted the glass at extremely high velocity, which is possible, or that could be a bubble. See the bubbles underneath? That blew out. Let's zoom in. I think we're at 800 times now at magnification. There's a bubble. Look at those bubbles. They still trap air from the original day when this happened inside those little bubbles. So focus. Look at that. I think it's an exploded bubble. Wow, it was probably something else in there that blew out because it had a completely different set of thermal characteristics than the actual glass. Anyway, it's amazing to look at this under the microscope. The video doesn't do it justice. It's better when photographs are taken, so I'll show you two photographs in just a moment that will better illustrate what it can look like. Look at the bubbles. Crystals and bubbles. The entire Trinitite sample is nothing but crystals and bubbles. It's kind of disturbing to say that it's kind of beautiful. I kind of almost wish I didn't say that. At 400 times magnification, the bubbles look absolutely beautiful. See how they're trapped forever? Of course, I adjusted the lighting here to make it easier to see and brought them into focus. Now, if you remember those tiny little circular pieces that I had, the one that looked like the tower and the little ones, here's one right here. And look on its surface, there's actually a tiny exposed bubble I found. It took me hours to find this thing. Look at it. It's a bubble on top of one of the little itty bitty circular pieces that I had. Absolutely stunning. Now, let's look at a gamma spectrum. So here we have a gamma spectrum. We have 1,024 little buckets right here. They're called channels. Each one of them collects gamma rays based on energy. So low energy gamma rays go here. High energy gamma rays go over here. And you have, wherever you see a concentration of them, that's usually emitted by a particular uh, radionuclide that spits out a gamma at that particular energy or right around it. For statistical reasons, you end up with a peak that's not a nice little simple line, which would be nice if we could just get a line, but this is a sodium iodide detector and it's not quite efficient enough to get a narrow line. Anyway, you can see we have a logarithmic view, so 0, 16, 256, 4,000, 64,000, 1 million, and 16 million counts. So not bad for, a, for, for the spectrometer too. You can buy fake trinitite samples, but you can always find a real one, not because they're radioactive. A lot of the fake ones are radioactive because they mix stuff with them and do all kinds of weird stuff but because you can take a fingerprint of it, a gamma, gamma ray fingerprint, if you like, a gamma spectrum. This is uh, the uh, practice of gamma spectroscopy. And here's what I detected. So we start off with cesium-137 right down the middle. This is the quintessential thing that comes from fission. Well, most common fission. Technically, there's weird forms of fission you could do that wouldn't necessarily end up with much of this. But for all the sorts of fission that humans do, plutonium, uranium, you're going to end up with lots of cesium-137. Um, Cesium-137 decays into barium-137M and then barium-137. You see right over here, there's barium uh, x-ray fluorescence and x-ray and x-rays also that are just plain emitted. Uh, right there's the tiny little peak. That's barium-137, so that's the daughter of cesium-137. Um, 
Samarium 152 is the next thing we see here. This is the K-alpha-1 X-ray. So basically what happens is Europium-152, which you see all throughout the spectrum, decays in, into two different things, and one of them is Samarium. And Samarium will, will emit um, uh, uh, X-rays here at 40 kiloelectron volts. So uh, again, you see this all kind of wraps up into one thing. Uh, let's see what else do we have. The actual shielding is lead around the detector, and the gamma rays and betas and alphas and stuff that are hitting the lead cause it to fluoresce. So you know how black light makes your like white clothing reflect black reflect back like the white at you when the black light hits it. Um, that's called fluorescence. You, ultraviolet for fluorescence. Well, X rays cause lead to fluoresce, which is kind of interesting. You can these X rays right back here, um, alphas and betas, and any energetic particle hitting the the uh, lead can do that. Now the sand that was at the Trinity test had a lot of Europium, well it didn't have a lot, but it had some Europium 151 in it, and 153 I believe is the two, um, 153 I believe is, a, I think is a stable isotope, I believe 151 is effectively stable, but technically not really. But anyway, what happens is 151 Europium captures a neutron and emits a gamma, and you end up with Europium-152. And then we see all these little peaks from Europium-152. They're all over the place. And there's some that go further this direction that we don't see on the spectrum and a couple less. So Europium-152 is quite an interesting radionuclide. You can see right here, it's all over the place. And that's definitely diagnostic of, uh, of uh, Trinitite. Europium-152 in concert with cesium-137. Now you can't see it very well here because I used a big thick um, a scintillator, but if I used a thin crystal scintillator, you might have seen the fact that there's americium-241 and its decay product uh, neptunium-237. They should be right in this area. And in fact, these two right here are suspiciously right in the right place for them. Their energies are pretty close too. I actually debated whether samarium-152 at K-alpha-1 was what I was seeing, or if this was actually a primary photo peak for um, americium-241. I'm still debating that topic right this moment. It could be one or the other. Because just like your smoke detector, you should find americium-241 right over in this area. There's an annihilation peak that occurs right here, and that's because you have uh, um, some pretty high energy emissions going on through here. Um, some positrons are being emitted that mix with electrons to produce uh, positronium, which decays into twin 511 keV um, uh, gamma rays. And so you get those guys there too. There's several different things that cause an annihilation peak to appear. So that's antimatter. And that is definitely a straight up trinitrite, uh, trinitite san uh, sample. That's what it looks like on the gamma spectrometer. This is a two hour test that I did. And it looks like my previous trinitite uh, sample pretty dead on. Though I have a nice gamma spectrometer, I'm not going to be able to resolve, you know, all the other weird trace stuff that you might find in here. Not, not readily. If I had something like a high purity germanium detector, I could. Anybody want to send me forty thousand to fifty thousand dollars to buy one? <laughs> no, no, really. If you like, like if you have like a hundred million dollars and you don't care, feel free. Anyway, so there you go. With a better detector, I could see more. By the way, I think that's a bismuth two fourteen peak that I didn't identify right over there. That's what it looks like off the top of my head. And oh, last but not least, there's potassium. I think that's more potassium than than is in my background because I do background removal. So. I'm thinking there was probably some potassium in the actual rock sample, too. The iron, of course, is probably the reason it's turned to green. It's nothing to do with the radiation. So, interesting. Here are photos of the tiny little pieces. Look how circular they are. And, of course, who can forget the larger chunks? Absolutely amazing. Here's another one. Look at the crystal forms. Wow. Absolutely stunning. And this big guy's got a thing stuck in it. Look at that big bubble. So, thanks for watching.